All right, well, good morning. This is week three of quarantine, so to speak. Uh, I'm recording this on Saturday, April 4th, and I'll be watching uh, along with my family and all of you tomorrow. Uh, before we get started, though, there are just a few things I want to mention. Uh, as many of you know, we are under a stay-at-home order through April 29th, uh, which is intended to slow the spread of the coronavirus. As I'm sure many of you also know, there are a number of opinions out there about how seriously to take these measures. You know, part of my job as a pastor is to provide guidance in applying what the Bible says to the situations of life that we're facing. So one of the perspectives I'd like to bring this morning is this. Growing to maturity in Jesus Christ has a lot to do with growing to understand God's Word so that your thinking is formed by it and so is your approach to the world. You know, not only so that you aren't tossed about by every wind and wave of teaching, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, but so you also aren't tossed about by every wind and wave of information and misinformation that comes your way. You know, as I mentioned, there are a lot of opinions out there about what's going on and what isn't going on, and I would encourage each of you to be someone who contributes to the solution, uh, not to the problem, and who rests assured that we can and should trust the authority which has been put in place and allowed to be in place by God. You know, as a Christian, uh, we have to look at things like uh, government and social order is a good thing. The first thing that God did for his people when he brought them out of slavery in Egypt was to give them laws and social order and structure because people uh, living together need these things. Now, we are all imperfect people living in an imperfect time in an imperfect world, and so nobody is doing everything exactly right. But God has still allowed this time, and he has allowed the government to operate, and in Romans 13, 1 through 7, we are clearly told where what the government is asking you to do doesn't uh, interfere with a moral imperative of God's word, you do what the government says. Uh, so I just want to bring that to everybody's attention. That is how we are making decisions uh, as, as a body of believers. And uh, it's what I want to uh, just reaffirm with everybody this morning. <clears throat> All right, so with that, we are continuing today in our message series, Becoming One. Through this, we are going, beginning to end in John's gospel, we're looking at God's desire to bring unity among his people, while exploring the dimensions of sin that operate in this life, right, and still create separation from God and from each other. So today we're going to see what that means when it comes to blindness, both physical blindness and spiritual blindness. And I'm going to move the uh, uh, I'm going to move the uh, PowerPoint across the screen here so that you can see that. All right. So we're continuing in our series, becoming one. And today we're looking at blindness, both physical blindness and spiritual blindness. All right, now as we prepare to do that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, God, thank you for who you are. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the victor, that you are on the throne, that no matter what is going on in this time, in this life, uh, we can trust in you, and we can know that this current age uh, will at some point come to an end, and uh, eternity will be ushered in. God, we pray that uh, we would understand what, as your followers, we should be doing today. That knowing what's coming for eternity and having our trust in you and our trust in that uh, would guide us as we make good decisions day by day about what to do in this life, uh, how to best serve you, and how to best uh, love our neighbors. We pray that as we come to your word this morning, we would have open minds, that we would be willing to hear what you have to say, and that we would be willing to do it as well. <clears throat> I pray that as a messenger of your word, I would speak it faithfully. I give myself uh, and all all of myself to you in this time. Amen. All right. Now, as I mentioned today, we're going to be uh, continuing in John's gospel. We'll be in uh, chapter 9, 
and I'm going to bring that across the screen now here. Uh, again, it's, I'm new at doing this, so just bear with me uh, as I uh, get to be better and better at it, hopefully. Uh, but today we'll be in John chapter 9. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 41. Uh, so if you've got your Bible, you can open up there. Uh, I'm going to read that. But before I read, I'd like to just go through again uh, some of the background information that helps us understand where we're coming into things today with chapter 9. So as I've mentioned, the Gospel of John was written by John, who was a disciple of Jesus. He was an eyewitness to everything, uh, Jesus' whole life and ministry, and he's given us a, a full account of everything that he knows to be true from him, what he has seen and what he has heard and what he uh, believes. And this is a guide for us. It's a guide for us to understand these things as well. Now, there are three major themes in John. The first is that Jesus is God. The second, Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ. Those two words mean the same thing. And God has given us a choice. That's the third theme. God has given us a choice, a choice to believe him or not. Now, to believe Jesus is to have life, as John says in chapter 20, verse 31, these things are written that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in him. Now, the life John's talking about is not only eternal life, it's also a new life that begins now as believers grow in their faith and approach life in this world differently through an understanding of eternity. And at this stage of John's gospel, I just want to point out that Jesus is near the end of his public ministry. For over three years, he's been proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. He's been performing miracles or signs, as John calls them. He's been training his disciples, and uh, the response to Jesus has been that some believe he's a prophet, others believe he might be the Messiah, and others are pretty sure that he's not. Uh, and are opposed to him. So we come into this situation here uh, where the religious leaders in particular are against Jesus because they've decided he's not from God. And it shows up again in chapter 9 as we begin reading. Uh, so let's do that now, uh, beginning in chapter 9 with verse 1. <clears throat> as Jesus was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples questioned him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After Jesus said these things, he spit on the ground made some mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes. Go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he left, washed, and came back seeing. His neighbors and those who formerly had seen him as a beggar said, Isn't this the man who sat begging? Some said, He's the one. No, others were saying, He just looks like him. The man kept saying, I am the one. Therefore they asked him, then how were your eyes opened? The man answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed I received, and I received my sight. Well, where is he? They asked. I don't know, the man said. They brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. The day that Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. So again the Pharisees asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, he told them. I washed and I can see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division among the Pharisees. Again they asked the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He's a prophet, he said. Now the Jews did not believe this about him, that the man was blind and received his sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had received his sight. They asked them, Is this your son, the one you say was born blind? How then does he now see? 
We know this is our son and that he was born blind, his parents answered, but we don't know how he now sees, and we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews, since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed Jesus as Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So a second time, the Pharisees summoned the man who had been blind and told him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. The fellow answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. Then the Pharisees asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I already told you, he said, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? Then the Pharisees ridiculed him. You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't even know where he's from. Oh, this is an amazing thing, the man told them. You don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, God listens to him. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man weren't from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. You were born entirely steeped in sin, they replied, and you are trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. When Jesus heard that he had th they had thrown the man out, he found him and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Well, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? The man asked. Jesus answered, You have seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said, and he worshipped Jesus. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees were with Jesus, and they heard him say these things, so they asked, We aren't blind too, are we? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. All right. Well, that was a good amount to kind of hear and take in, wasn't it? So... Let's kind of go back through this and take a look at what's happened here. Uh, now, as I mentioned, the religious leaders have become opposed to Jesus. They don't like what he's doing. They don't agree with his teaching. They don't like that he disregards their traditions, particularly their Sabbath rules. And they really don't know how to explain the miracles that he's doing. As we look at this passage... I want to kind of point out that it's structured in what I would call three sections. Uh, first, there's the healing of a man born blind and the reaction to it of those who knew him. That's verses 1 through 12. Uh, second, there's the investigation of that healing by the Pharisees and the things that occurred during that investigation. That happens in verses 13 through 34. And third the healed man's second encounter uh, with Jesus is, is given to us. And we see that there is the reaction of some Pharisees who are also there with them. And that happens in verses 35 through 41. Now, some of your Bibles may have subsections that uh, follow what I've laid out here, and some of them might not. But I'm just kind of showing you how I see uh, that these things are laid out uh, as far as the transition of events. And we're going to go through them in this order, verses 1 through 12, then 13 through 34, and then 35 through 41. Now, I want to point out a major contrast that's presented through, through all of this is the man's physical blindness compared with the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees. And the question that's being asked and answered is which one of these is truly the result of sin? So with that in mind, let's look at verses 1 through 12, which is the healing of the man and the reaction of his neighbors. Now, again, in the two chapters ahead of where we began reading, chapters 7 and 8, Jesus and his disciples are at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Jesus has been teaching. The religious leaders took issue with him during that time. Jesus made it very clear he was sent by God as the fulfillment to the promise given to Abraham. 
And all that ended up with the Pharisees picking up stones to try and kill Jesus. But Jesus was hidden from them. He went out of the temple complex. And then beginning here in verse 1 of chapter 9, we're picking up right on the end of that, that time when Jesus has walked out of the temple complex. And it says, As Jesus was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. Jesus' disciples asked him, O Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's work might be displayed in him. Now let's take a look here at what the disciples are asking and Jesus' response to them. So after leaving the temple complex, Jesus sees a man who's blind from birth, and his disciples ask the question, Who sinned for this to happen, the man or his parents? Now, the reason for their question is because it was commonly believed in their day that suffering uh, was the result of sin. The rabbis taught that personal sin resulted in things like sickness, poverty, childlessness, and all other sorts of curses. Uh, birth defects were believed to be either the result of the parents' sin affecting the children or that infants could actually sin in the womb and bring these things on themselves. So this is what Jesus' disciples are asking about. These are the kinds of things that they've been told and they've been taught in the synagogues as they're growing up. These are the cultural beliefs of their day. And they're asking Jesus about it. Did this man sin in the womb or did this come about because of the sin of his parents? Well, Jesus' response to this is neither. It's not one or the other, right? This is not the result of the man's personal sin, and it's not the result of his parents' sin. Jesus says this came about so that God's work might be displayed in him, verse 3. So Jesus contradicts the idea that the man's physical condition is the result of something he or his parents did wrong. This is not a punishment or judgment from God, but it's something that will allow God's work to be seen. It will bring God glory. And with that, Jesus goes on in verses 4 through 7 to both include his disciples in this work and then to go ahead and do it, to actually do the work. So let's look at this, uh, beginning with verse 4. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After Jesus said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus told the man, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man left, washed, and came back seeing. Now, a few things I want to point out here. In verse 4, Jesus says, we must do the works of him who sent me. By saying we instead of I, Jesus is including his disciples in his mission. And he's also letting, him, letting them know there's an urgency. The work should be done now. In other words, while it's day. Uh, while Jesus is physically with them is what he means. The time is now. So while it's day, while we're together, while the time is now, let's do this. Now this is because night is coming when Jesus says no one can work. And in this, Jesus is referring to his coming death on the cross, which is made obvious from the following statement where he says in verse 5, as long as I am in the world. So Jesus has in mind the time when he's not going to be in the world. Right? He's actually thinking about the period of time when he's going to be apart from his disciples. So there are things to be done specifically in this time, and Jesus does them. Right? He gets to work and he heals the man. Jesus spits on the ground to make mud. He puts it on the man's eyes. He tells the man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Then the man goes, he washes, and he comes home seeing. So Jesus, who is the light of the world, has literally brought light to this man's eyes, which were darkened from birth. And this brings us right to the main point, which is this. Jesus brings sight. Jesus brings sight. Let me slide this across the screen here, right? Jesus brings sight. You know, and that's because Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus brings sight because he's the light of the world. 
Jesus says in verse 5, I am the light of the world. He says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. And John says of Jesus in chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, something I want to talk about here is why I call this the main point. When I look through a section of Scripture, the first question I ask is, what is this saying about God, right? And what we have here is Jesus, who is God, he's God the Son, teaching about himself, and everything in the passage is connected to the light he gives. And in what Jesus is saying, he's connecting himself to the Word of God, as well as its purpose. Uh, let's look at Psalm 119.105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It shows me the way I should go both day and night. Psalm 119, verse 130, if we would uh, continue on. The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the humble. And then if we'd move on to verses 133 through 135. Direct my footsteps, Lord, according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from the oppression of men, that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your decrees. The man Jesus heals both receives actual uh, light to his eyes, he can see, and he receives spiritual light. He comes to understand who Jesus is and eventually to follow him. This man who's been healed, he, his, he was humbled by his physical condition, right? He receives understanding of God's word and he's freed from the oppression of sin, right? The oppression of men. And he becomes a disciple of Jesus. Through faith in Jesus, he becomes a servant of God and seeks to learn God's word or God's decrees. And I see this paralleling uh, quite a bit what we just went through in Psalm 119. Now, something I want to point out is the Word of God gives light, and that light does two things. First, it frees from the oppression of sin. It provides freedom from the oppression of sin. And second, it exposes the existence of sin. Right? So it frees from the oppression of sin, and it exposes the existence of sin. As Romans says, God gave his word or his law so that sin might be exposed. Right? Not that it didn't exist in the world before the law was given, just that sin was not clearly seen for what it is until the law came. And as the word of God, the light of the world, Jesus' presence in the world exposes its condition, right? The condition of the world is exposed by the presence of Jesus, and that condition is the condition of fallenness, which is the result of sin. Now, this is key to understanding Jesus' response to his disciples when he talks to them about the man's blindness. And that's because it's not like sin has no part in the man's condition, but it's not specifically his sin, it's not the man's sin, and it's not his parents' sin that's at play here. It's the sin of the world that has caused the man's blindness. And this is an important understanding for God's people now, just as it was then, because disease, sickness, what we call birth defects and so on, these are not necessarily the result of any individual person's sin. They are largely consequences of a fallen world. Now, sure, some things can be the result of a parent's sin, right? For example, drinking alcohol while you're pregnant will affect your baby. But that's a specific cause and effect due to a personal choice, right? The understanding should be that all things in this world are not the way they're supposed to be because the world is in a time of sin and it carries certain consequences, certain effects that aren't the result necessarily of individual choices. It's just the state of how things are. This time exists from the fall of Adam to the return of Jesus, and the effects of sin should not be seen as God's judgment. They should be seen as the results of our choices and the results of our first parents' choice 
for something other than what God said was good. See, God's redeeming work in Jesus is intended to set things right, to restore the world and his people from sin and fallenness. And while that restoration won't be totally complete until the new heaven and earth are revealed, God's redeeming work can be seen in his people as they take in the light of his word. And this is the point that Jesus is making when he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. Right? Through our sin and fallenness, God's work displays his glory, displays his goodness, which brings us to two points that I'd like to make, and I'm going to bring those across the screen here right before I uh, say them. All right? So the two points I'd like to make are these. First, bad things are not God's judgment. Bad things are not God's judgment. And second, the truth being seen is testimony to Jesus. The truth being seen is testimony to Jesus. I'm going to take a moment to explain both of those. God's judgment is not playing out in the day-to-day -day events of our lives in this world. God is not the author of evil. He doesn't cause bad things to happen. We do. And God has already moved in time to judge the sin of the world. He's done this in Christ, and the judgment of God we should have in mind as believers is not now, but the one that's coming in the end. This is what Paul talks about in Romans 2, 5 through 6, when he says, Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. On that day, God will give to each person according to what he's done. Paul is saying here there's a day coming when God's judgment will be revealed. That day he's talking about is the last day. It's not any day before that. Right? It's the day of the Lord. If you're a believer, your personal sin has all been judged on the cross, along with the sin of the world. Now, this doesn't mean that God won't discipline you now, but you should understand that God is not judging you now. And second, the second thing is this. As God's work is made known in our lives, God's glory is revealed. And this is a testimony to Jesus. That's one of the purposes of God's light within you. It will begin to show that things are changing, which is one aspect of your witness. Now, not surprisingly, it's what happened with the man who received his sight. His friends and neighbors saw a change. They wondered if he was even the same guy. News spread, and it gave him the opportunity to be a witness. And this is what happened not only after he went home, but also when the Pharisees investigated what happened to him. So let's take a look at that now by asking this question. What was the man's testimony? What was the man's testimony? Well, his testimony was the truth. He told what he knew. And what he knew was what happened to him. It didn't turn out to be well-received, but that didn't change what he had to say. This is what goes on in verses 13 through 34, so let's review those again, beginning in 13. <clears throat> they, the friends and the neighbors, brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. The day Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. So again the Pharisees asked him how he received his sight. The man told them, He put mud on my eyes, I washed, and I can see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man, referring to Jesus, is not from God, because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Now let's stop here for a minute and look at a few things. There's a great interest in how Jesus healed the man because it involves making mud, and that happened on the Sabbath. 
We see that from verse 14 where John tells us the day Jesus made the mud was the Sabbath and that was the day he opened the guy's eyes. And in verse 15 where again the Pharisees want to know how the healing was done. They're very interested in specifically how Jesus did it because of this mud making on the Sabbath. See, the big issues, issue for the Pharisees is that the Sabbath is the Jewish day of rest. And nobody is supposed to do any work. Mud making, by the way, qualifies as work. The Pharisees have all kinds of rules and regulations that they follow, and they're very concerned with keeping these. And they consider making mud to be work, and that violates one of their Sabbath rules. Now, not all the Pharisees in the group see things the same way after the man tells what happened, and that's kind of interesting. Some are fixated only on Jesus doing what they think breaks the Sabbath, and for this reason they say he can't be from God. Others are like, well, wait a minute, the miracle is obviously from God, so how can you say that Jesus isn't? How can you call him a sinful man? So the group is divided, and they go for another round of questioning. In verse 17, they ask the man who was healed, what do you say about him? Since he opened your eyes, what do you say about him? And the guy answers, he's a prophet. And that's probably the most likely explanation the man could think of for somebody who had done such a miraculous thing. Then some of the Jews question, do we really know if this man actually was blind to begin with? So they got to figure that out. They're not sure if he actually was healed. Was he really blind to begin with, or is this some kind of a hoax? So they call the man's parents in. In verses 19 through 23, the parents basically tell them, yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind. No, we don't know how he was healed, but he's no little kid that you need to ask us these things. He's of age. Verse 23, you can ask him. Now, one of the things that John clues us into in verse 22 is the Jews were banning people from the synagogue who said that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, so the guy's parents were afraid to say too much because they didn't want to get excommunicated. Now, before we deal with that, I want to do go back and touch on one thing. Uh, Jesus did more healings of the blind than any other miracle. And in Scripture, in Isaiah and, and the other prophets, these are things that were told about uh, for the Messiah, that uh, he would open the eyes of the blind. And so this is one of the reasons that many people are believing Jesus might be the Christ. And so the Pharisees, who don't believe that he is and are very opposed to this, right? they don't want anybody confessing Jesus as Messiah. So they are threatening excommunication for those who do. It's helpful to know in Jesus' time that being banned from the synagogue or being excommunicated didn't mean uh, that you were not allowed to worship. What it meant is that you weren't allowed to do anything else. And there were all kinds of social activities that took place at and through the synagogue. At this time, the synagogue was the hub of the community. Everything happened there, not just worship and teaching, but all kinds of social events. To get cut off from this would be really difficult. So these guys were wielding a pretty powerful threat. This is something I'm sure each of us can relate to, particularly at this time when we're all cut off from each other. Right? It's especially hard because human beings are social creatures. This is because we're designed for relationship. We're designed to be in relationship with God. We're designed to be in relationship with each other. God made Adam, and he even said, it's not good for the man to be alone. So he made him a partner, not just a friend, but a co-worker. And we're designed not only to play together, but to work together and to worship together. We are designed to be in close contact, fellowship, and relationship with one another. Even for those who are loners and introverts, right, there's still the need for other people. To be made in the image of God means to be designed for relationship. That's one of the aspects of it. God's never been alone, and he didn't make us to be either. God is three persons who are one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are together in perfect relationship. They 
live within each other. They have an interpenetrating or an indwelling relationship with one another. And God has never been alone. He didn't design us to be alone either. So it tends to be really hard for people to make decisions that involve restricting social activity. But a reality we should clearly see is decisions for Jesus are sometimes going to result in losses of relationship and even comfort. Right now, making decisions for Jesus to comply with the governing authorities, as Romans 13, 1 through 7 tells us, and to love your neighbor as yourself, as not only Jesus tells us, but Leviticus 19, 18 does as well, it means not doing what you might want to do because loving God and loving your neighbor takes a different shape right now. It means actually staying away from your neighbor rather than hanging out with them. But it's still the same principle of obedience to God's word and doing what's right for others, even though you may not like it, even if it costs you something, and even if what it costs you is hard to give up. But this is a reality of making decisions for Jesus. They will involve making decisions for the truth over social comfort. That's what the man who was healed had to do. And this was his testimony. Which is a point every believer should understand. Testimony to Jesus is telling the truth. No matter what it costs you, no matter how uncomfortable it is, and it may mean doing things that you really don't like. And we see it with the man in verses 24 through 34 when he's called in a second time. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind, and they told him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. So they brought the man in again, and they put him under oath. That's what give glory to God is. It's a, it's a Hebrew oath. Just like uh, put your hand on the Bible and, and swear that you'll solemnly tell the truth. And they tell him, we know this man's a sinner, so you better say it too, is what's implied there. But the guy says, look, here's what I know. I was blind and now I can see, verse 25. He simply tells the truth. The Pharisees ask again how Jesus did this. How did he do it? And the guy says, I already told you. Why do you want to hear it again? You want to become his disciples too? And the guy's getting a little snippy with him. You know, he doesn't have a perfect attitude, um, but none of us are perfect people. And this really gets their dander up. They ridicule the man, and in verse 28 and 29, they say, We're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but for this man, Jesus, we have no idea where he comes from. Then this man who's been healed does something that's actually quite bold. Right, if you look at verses uh, 30 through 33, he reasons with them about Jesus using what he knows and what they should know from God's word, from the scriptures. This is an amazing thing. You don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. Seriously, guys, you can't see that he's from God. We know God doesn't listen to sinners. In other words, God doesn't do what they ask, not that he doesn't listen to them. That's not what it means. God searches our hearts. He knows our every thought in our mind and, and all of this. Uh, it's not that God doesn't listen to sinners. It's that he doesn't do what they ask. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, God does listen to him. In other words, God does what they ask. No one's ever heard of a person opening the eyes of someone born blind. Guys, this has never happened before. No person, no doctor has ever done this. It has to be from God. So follow me on this, all right? Stick with me here, guys. If God won't do what a sinful person asks, but God has done what this man asked, then how can you say he's not from God? Come on. Now, the guy's reasoning is pretty sound, and it's straight from the Word. So he really puts these educated teachers to shame. Rather than taking the correction, though, they retaliate with an insult. You were born entirely in sin, or you were steeped in sin from your birth, uh, how the NIV puts it, and you're trying to teach us. And then they throw him out. This, by the way, only shows their arrogance and further underlines their spiritual condition. They've rejected testimony. They've rejected correction from God's word. They're calling Jesus and this man both sinners, 
and they've revealed their own blindness. While they can see physically, they can't see spiritually, and they're unaware of their own sin. That's actually what demonstrates it. You know, growing close to God is not going to mean that your sin disappears. It means you're going to see it more clearly and more frequently. As you accept God's word within you, the light is going to show what's there, and it shows that all of us fall short in this life. That's what Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And it shows that we all stumble in many ways. Uh, it's James 3.2. People who believe they're close to God but don't believe they have sin, they actually have a problem. It's the problem of self-deception, which shows up next when Jesus rejoins the healed man and talks about why he's here. So let's take a look at that now, and I'm going to bring this slide across the screen while we do that. Why does Jesus say he's here? Why does Jesus say he's here? Well, he says he's come for judgment. He's come to open the eyes of the blind. And he's come to close the eyes of those who think they can see this is what comes out in verses 35 through 41, and what I'd like to do is draw your attention to a few things. See, Jesus heard the man had been thrown out, and he went to find him. Jesus asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy says, well, who is he that I may believe in him? Now, something to keep in mind, this is probably the first time the guy has actually seen Jesus. He was blind at their first encounter. Jesus put the mud on his eyes. The guy had to go to the pool and wash before he could see. He probably has not seen Jesus before. And he also might be confused uh, by Jesus' use of a messianic title, the Son of Man. But Jesus tells him in verse 37, you have seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. And the guy recognizes something about Jesus, something that causes him to believe and to worship. So in some sense, he comes to understand Jesus as the Messiah and as being from God. Now, no Jew would ever worship another human being because they could not conceive of that person being God. So there's something going on here because this man has worshipped Jesus and so he understands on some level that Jesus is divine. You know, and this is this is the truth. This is exactly who Jesus is. He's the son of God and he's the son of man. And Jesus use of the title son of man emphasizes both his humanity and his divinity as well as his future role as judge of all creation. But Jesus talks about judgment not as a future thing right here in the next verse in verse 39. Jesus talks about judgment as a current aspect of his mission in the world by saying, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. Now, the judgment Jesus is talking about here is not the future judgment, not the one that's coming at the end of the age. Jesus is using judgment in another way that the Bible uses the word. And what he's talking about is that his presence in the world brings judgment in the sense of decision-making. Because of Jesus' presence, people have to make a decision about him, and they have to make decisions about themselves because of him. And the decision you have to make is whether you'll see or you won't, whether you'll receive the light or you'll turn away from it. You know, the light shines in the darkness, but as John says in Chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, not everyone will come to the light because not everyone wants to. Uh, this then is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. Then in verse 21, John goes on, but anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. Anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light 
so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. See, there's a choice between seeing and not seeing, depending on whether you'll come to the light or you'll turn from it. The point Jesus is making is some will choose to see and others will choose not to. Which brings us right to the heart of the word, and it's this. Seeing is choosing the light. Seeing is choosing the light. The word of God will shine light in dark places, but this is the exact reason God has sent his word into the world. The choice for each of us is this, to come out of our blindness by coming into the light of God's word, or to stay in darkness by refusing the light. See, not all will come out of darkness, and for some, it's not because they reject the idea of Jesus. It's because they don't allow his light to come in. Look at the Pharisees who were with Jesus and the man in verses 40 and 41. Some of the Pharisees who were with Jesus heard these things and asked him, We aren't blind too, are we? If you were blind, Jesus told them, you wouldn't have sin." But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. Now this can sound a little confusing at first, but let me suggest to you, this is what's being said. If you were physically blind, it wouldn't be due to sin. But since you have the light with you, and you say that you see when you really don't, you remain in your sin. You see, these Pharisees, though they claim to see spiritually, lack the sight to see within themselves, and they lack the sight to see who Jesus really is. They don't see him for who he is, they don't understand that he's the light, and they don't understand their own spiritual condition. They don't see within themselves, they don't understand their fallenness and the sin that exists in their own lives. And this creates a false pride or righteousness. And this false pride makes them as blind as the man was before Jesus healed him. That's the point of everything Jesus is telling them. As long as they continue this way, they'll never understand their true need for God and his righteousness. They'll remain blind to their true need for Jesus, and they won't ever come to him and come into the healing that he provides. If they truly saw spiritually, they'd recognize the sin in their own lives and the fact they can't overcome it. They'd recognize the true condition of the world and that it'll remain this way until God changes it. And they wouldn't see themselves as being so different from those they're judging and calling sinners. And this brings us to one very simple point that I want to make clear. Believing you have no sin is the greatest of sin's deceptions. Believing you have no sin is the greatest of its deceptions. It's the greatest barrier also to relationship both with God and with other people because it's an absolute blindness to yourself. You see, the light of God's word should not only show you who he is, it should also show you who you are. And it should show you the true condition of this world and everyone in it. But those who refuse the light fail to see this until it's too late. You see, the evidence of God's work in you is not the absence of sin. It's actually your awareness of it. Sin is something that will not be eradicated from you in its complete form and its completeness, nor will it be eradicated from the world until the time set by God. And the closer you get to him in this life, the closer you get to God in this life, the more aware of sin you should become. And I think this is a big misconception even for many who claim to be followers of Jesus, who think, well, I've accepted Jesus, so I'm good, right? I no longer have any sin. Jesus' work on the cross is complete, right? And so all sin is forgiven, and so it's completely gone from my life. You know, I want to point out here, Jesus' work on the cross is complete, And in the ultimate sense, God has removed your sin from you as far as the east is from the west, right? He's removed it from you completely in the ultimate sense. But in the here and now, in this life, each of us 
who's in Christ, is walking toward that day when what's been completed on the cross completely is then completed in each of our lives fully. And we should not be blind to the struggle with sin that we encounter day over day over day this side of heaven. Nor should you allow that struggle to lead you into despair. Right? There are two understandings to have. Yes, I am completely redeemed in Jesus Christ, and yes, that is a future time when it will fully come to fruition in my life. So God sees me as completely sin-free, completely redeemed, but he also knows that I am not there yet. And I have to see myself the same way too. This realization of sin in your life should not lead you into despair. Right? The struggle against it should not cause you uh, to be hopeless. A true understanding of God in Jesus shouldn't result in condemnation, but it should result in hope and gratitude. It should result in a desire to move out of your sin. But the reality of your stumbling that you're going to encounter day over day over day should not stop you in your pursuit of God. Nor should it stop you from continuing in his work in this life, going to others with the good news of Jesus and making disciples. Right, Going to others uh, and sharing with them your life, sharing with them the truth, and teaching those who are willing and able how to follow Jesus. And on top of this, <clears throat> you've got to allow other people to see who you truly are in Christ, who you are right now as someone who's not perfect, but someone who's in process, right? But in all things, someone who trusts in the perfection of the one who is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, God, thank you that you have made us. Thank you that you have redeemed us. Thank you that you are working on us. God, thank you that we can trust you that at the time that you know everything is complete, uh, you will uh, bring all of that into its fullness. God, help us in this life to understand who we are in you and help us to allow others to see who we are in you as well, not to represent ourselves as anything other than we are right now. God, help us to uh, truly come to understand that each step on the journey is a valid place to be, that your work is being accomplished uh, every moment of every day, that uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with who we were, uh, that's just a step in getting to who you're making us into. And help us to be able to allow your work to be displayed in our own lives, uh, to not hide from others who you are or what you're doing in us. God, we thank you and we love you, and it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. All right, that's what I've got for this morning. I'm gonna try and put this last slide across here. All right. Thanks, everybody.